reading is taken from the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5 and the first, and sorry, verses 12 through to 15. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word which to us is precious. And your word that speaks to us in every verse. Father, we ask that by your spirit you would enable me to preach and all of us to receive what you would say. Not the words of man, but what you would say. And Father, we ask for the grace to be able to respond accordingly. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Through Jesus. Amen. We come to the end of Peter's first letter. <coughs> And though some might think that Peter's final greeting might not have much to say to us, I would, I would differ. In these last three verses, we get a glimpse of how the early church operated. And this might help us 2,000 years later. So let's take a look. Well, the first thing I ask you to notice is that though this is a letter from Peter, in his closing remarks, he mentions two, possibly three, other people. The first one is Silas, with the help of Silas, or literally, through Silas. Through Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. So it's through Silas that, that Peter is writing. And Silas appears several times in the New Testament. Perhaps the best known point is in the book of Acts, where we meet him as Paul's travelling companion and assistant. And in Acts 16, we see Silas sharing Paul's hardships in Philippi, as the two of them were imprisoned for casting a demon out of a slave girl. Well, Silas is a faithful Christian brother. In Acts, he's the assistant to Paul. And here, he was working with Peter. There was no rivalry between the apostles. They worked together to tell people about Jesus and plant churches. Here, Silas is with Peter. And in, in, in 2 Timothy, Mark is with Paul. They worked together, they complemented one another in the work of the Gospel. And that's perhaps the most important thing to notice here. As Christian brothers and sisters, we're not meant to operate on our own. We're not meant to be solo artists. We're meant to work together. And this is the point that Paul's making in our first reading from Romans 12. For just as each of us has one body with many parts, and those parts do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, the body of Christ on earth. And each member belongs to all the others. We're called and commanded by Jesus to come together as his people. That's what the church is, the ecclesia, those who have been called out. He's called us out of the world and he's called us together to be his body in this place. 
And just as our bodies need each part, each limb, each organ, each vein and artery to be able to function, to be able to live, so the church needs each and every one of us, every one of you. No one person can do everything. Each member of the congregation is important and is vital to the work. You might not think so, but the word says it, so it's true. As each part of our body belongs to the whole, that's my hand, but it belongs to the rest of my body. The rest of my body belongs to my hand. So each member, each person in Christ's body belongs to the rest. We belong to each other. We're responsible for one another and we're responsible to one another. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. God has called us together and each and every believer is called. Each and every believer without exception has been given grace and grace is a lovely word and grace is the key to our salvation. The word that's translated as grace in the New Testament means favour, it means goodwill, it means a beneficent disposition. And this is the favour of God that we do not deserve. It is grace that brought Jesus to earth. It's God's goodwill and favour towards us. It is grace that Jesus brought for us in his horrific death on the cross. God's heart is filled with love for each and every human being, no matter who they are, from Vladimir Putin to Mr. Trump to you and me here. God's heart is filled with love for each and every one of us. He longs for relationship with each and every one of us. But our sin, the fact that we're not perfect, cuts us off from him. So he's unable to accept us. We're filthy, we're soiled, we're abhorrent in his sight because of our sin. Not, be, not, the, not because it's heinous, but because it's sin, because it's imperfection, because it's against the nature of God. Our sin stands in the way, but Jesus has dealt with the problem of our sin. His death atones for it. He atones for it all. It removes it from us altogether. In his death and resurrection, Jesus purchased the grace that puts us right with God. And it's grace that makes it possible for us to know him, to be right with him to live in his love. And each and every person who will believe, each and every person who will repent, who will turn away from sin, from all that they know is wrong in their lives, each and every one who will commit their lives to Jesus is forgiven. They receive grace. They receive God's favour. Without exception, they enter a state of grace. We live in the grace, in the favour of God. We begin to live in God's loving kindness. And each and every person who commits themselves to Jesus is not only given grace, they're called by God. God has called you. We're called to live as his children. And more than that, we are gifted to serve. Without exception, we are all gifted and enabled in some way. Jesus has given his people a commission. And that's a commission that we all share. To make disciples of all nations. To be disciples of Jesus together. And that is what each church is. 
each and every church is or should be a community of disciples called to serve together, called to tell the world about Jesus. We are called to call them. We're called to invite all who will listen to come to Jesus make disciples of them and one another and each and every one of us has a part to play in this we've all received grace we've all been called to serve and without exception we have all we have each been equipped to serve we've all been gifted in some way there are those who say that, that God hasn't gifted them, that they can't do anything, but it's rubbish. God has gifted and enabled us. It's up to us to pray and to discover those gifts and to help one another discover our gifts and then use them to build one another up in discipleship and to build the church together. Well, Peter wrote this letter with the help of Silas. Literally, through Silas, he wrote this letter. Silas was his assistant. He was possibly the scribe who wrote for Peter. Now, Peter was a fisherman. And although fishermen weren't the lowest of the low, perhaps his greed wasn't quite good enough. So it was customary in that day for people to pay scribes to write the letters for them. Somehow, Silas was essential to Peter. It could be that Silas was the messenger who delivered the letter. We're not told. But what we do know is that Peter wrote to the recipients of this letter through Silas. In verse 14, Peter sends greetings from Mark who Peter describes as his son. So close and so useful was, Pete, was Mark to his ministry. The early church tell us that, uh, that, that Mark was Peter's translator and assistant. And it's reckoned that it's Mark who wrote the gospel that bears his name. And that Mark's gospel is the recollections of Peter. Each and every believer is called to serve. And like Silas and like Mark, each and every one of us has a part to play, a role, a calling to fulfil. And if the church is to function properly, then we need each to commit and play our part. It is essential that each and every believer takes this seriously. Well, it's thought that Peter wrote this letter from Rome. That's the consensus among the scholars. Verse 13 says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings. Well, this is a somewhat enigmatic phrase. She who is in Babylon. Well, we know that Babylon was a euphemism for Rome. We see that in the book of Revelation. And as the early church said that Peter was writing from Rome, that would make sense. But who she is, is not so clear. Because the original Greek says literally, the one in Babylon, co-chosen with you, greets you. So it could be a woman, but He's named Silas and he's named Mark, so why not, why not name her? So for that reason, it's widely thought that she who is in Babylon refers to the church in Rome. And as the emperor by this time was Nero, Rome was becoming an uncomfortable village. <coughs> as he was writing to believers in churches in Asia Minor, in modern Turkey, it would be natural for him to send greetings from the church he was working in. But the point here 
is that they were all in it together. They were comrades in arms. And that's something that we need to recover, especially in these strange and evil days. Peter was writing with the help of Silas to the builders in the area which is now in modern Turkey to encourage them and to testify that what he was writing was the true grace of God. He was writing at a time when there were false teachers. There were those who were perverting the gospel. There were people who were unwittingly doing the devil's work, leading people away from the truth, away from Jesus, to destruction. So Peter was writing to remind them of the truth. And if you can remember all the way back to chapter 1, at the beginning of the letter, Peter wrote, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, waiting for you. This is the gospel, that we have salvation through Jesus Christ, through the mercy of God. For even when we were lost in our sins, wholly estranged from God, God sent Jesus to die for our sins. And all who will accept him, all who will put their faith in him, who commit themselves fully to Jesus, are given that new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and on the third day was raised to life. And all those who believe get to share in his resurrection. We're born again. We're born again through it. And the new birth is essential to the gospel. Jesus himself said in John 3, that no one can see, let alone enter, the kingdom of God, unless they're born again. To be saved, to be forgiven, to get into heaven, we have to be born again. Born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus says in John 3. But the moment anyone comes to believe, the moment they repent, and reorientate their life towards God, accepting Jesus as Lord, they're born again. Their sin is forgiven. From that moment they are in Christ. And the Holy Spirit, God himself, comes to dwell in them. That is essential to the Gospel. And essential to you and to me. Because if we're not born again, we're not Christian at all. We're still in our sins and bound for hell. But if you aren't born again, you can be. Even now, tell God that you're sorry for your sins. Even now, believe. Put your faith in Jesus who died for you and ask him to come in and be Lord of your life. Commit yourself to him right now. For God will accept everyone who truly believes. So don't leave it till it's too late. Peter writes, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Peter wants his readers that means he wants us to stand fast, to hold on to the truth and not be moved from it. He wants us to hold on to Jesus, to continue in our faith and live for him. So we need to decide to stand firm, fast to the end, trusting in the power of God, not in our own strength. We need to stand firm in the gospel, for the gospel is the only hope for humanity. 
and telling others, making disciples, is the reason the church exists. We each have to take this seriously and play our part, fulfil our calling as we work together for Jesus. Well, finally, Peter closes with this letter saying, Greet one another with a kiss of love. I'm not going to ask anybody to kiss me. Not at this time, I don't want germs. We share, we share in Christ together. We're brothers and sisters in him. And it's love, the love of God expressed to one another, that binds us as God's children together. Remember what's written in John's first letter. We love because he, because God, first loved us. We know what love is through Jesus. Love for our brothers and sisters in Christ comes with the new birth. It's part of the evidence that we're born again. So Peter calls us to express that love to one another. And he closes with the words, Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace, wholeness, well-being, everything put right. And that is what we have in Jesus. How blessed we are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your word which reveals the reality of you. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that Jesus became one of us, that Jesus, God, took on flesh and lived and died for us. Father, we thank you that his death purifies us from all sin. And Father, we believe, we believe, and we celebrate his resurrection. And Father, tonight we recommit, we trust ourselves to you afresh, claiming Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And we ask for the grace to stand firm to the end, whatever that might be. Give us the grace and the courage to be church together, to willingly serve you together as parts of the one body. And we thank you, we thank you, through Jesus.